In this section, I will look at configuring the Distributed File System, or DFS. DFS provides a way to manage your file shares in your enterprise to make it easier for your end users to find data. In this video, I will first look at what is DFS. DFS was first introduced in Windows Server 2000, and since then, Microsoft has continued to make improvements. Next, I will look at how to install DFS. If you are using Windows Server 2008, there are some additional features you may want to look at. Next, I will look at the options you can configure in DFS. Depending on how large your DFS infrastructure is, you may need to do some fine tuning. Lastly, I will look at how to configure DFS. Using DFS correctly in your organization can help organize your file shares, making it easier for your end users to find information. In a large organization, there can be hundreds of file shares spread out over many different servers over many different sites. This can make it very difficult for users to find the data that they are after, and often means mapping a large amount of network drives. Distributed File System, or DFS, allows a user to access many different file shares using the same namespace. Consider this. You have two servers located on different sides of the world that a user needs to access. Normally, the user would need to map two different network drives to these servers. With DFS, you can create one DFS route which can access both shares. When a user accesses the DFS route and attempts to access one of the folders, the user is redirected to the server that contains the file share. The end user does not need to know the name of the file share or the server on which it is located. DFS also allows you to create replicates throughout the network and keep them up to date. In any organization, unfortunately, you are going to have duplication of data. End users are going to keep copies of the same data on their local server that is already on another server. Imagine a system that allows the end user to keep a copy of the same data on every server and changes to that data are automatically replicated to every other server on the network. This is essentially what DFS does. Given this example, you could create a replicate of the two shares on the other servers. When a user attempts to access DFS, the user will automatically be taken to the closest server with a copy of that share on it. This also allows you to create redundancy on your network. All the user sees is a single share which can connect them to an unlimited number of shares on the network completely transparently. To install the distributed file system, run Server Manager and then select the option Roles and then select Add Roles. Once you are past the welcome screen, you need to select the role File Services. Once I press Next and skip the File Services welcome screen, I need to add the Distributed File Services component. When installing DFS, the two components of the DFS system are DFS Namespace and DFS Replication. DFS Namespace is basically the heart of the DFS system. It is what allows you to create the DFS Namespace, which can be mapped to by the end users. The DFS replication component allows you to replicate data files across the network. Generally, in most scenarios, you will want to leave both these components selected. The installation wizard now gives you the option to create a DFS namespace. If you wish, you can create a DFS namespace later on by selecting the second option. In this case, I will create a new namespace called General. Once I have entered the name and moved on in the wizard, I will get the option to select a domain name based namespace or a standalone namespace. A standalone namespace is created on the server on which you are hosting DFS. If I created a standalone namespace in this example, the end user would access it by mapping a drive to FS3. 
The disadvantage of this is if FS3 is not available, the user could not access the DFS namespace, even if the DFS namespace was directing the user to a file share on another file server. With standalone namespace, you can host a namespace on a failover cluster. This will give you some redundancy when using a standalone namespace. If I select the default, domain name based namespace, the DFS namespace will be stored in Active Directory. This gives you a lot more redundancy as all domain controllers on your network will have a copy of your DFS namespace. Notice the option Enable Windows Server 2008 mode. This is currently grayed out. In order to use Windows Server 2008 mode, a number of prerequisites have to be met. First of all, your domain function level must be set to at least Windows Server 2008, and your forest function level must be set to at least Windows Server 2003. To find out what function level your domain is, from Administrator Tools under the Start menu, run Active Directory Domains and Trusts, and then right-click and select Raise Domain Function Level. Currently, you can see my function level is Windows Server 2003. In order to use the additional features of Windows Server 2008 DFS, I need to change my domain function level to Windows Server 2008. To upgrade the domain function level is a simple matter of pressing Raise. Take note that once you press Raise and then press OK, the change is irreversible. In order to make this change, all your domain controllers in your domain must be running Windows Server 2008. You will also need to check your forest level. To do this, right-click on Active Directory Domains and Trusts and select Raise Forest Function Level. Currently, this forest is set to Windows Server 2003. To enable Windows Server 2008 mode for DFS, you only require Windows Server 2003 forest level. If your forest level is set to Windows Server 2000, you will need to raise the forest level to at least Windows Server 2003. Remember, your forest must meet the requirements, and if you raise your forest level, this is a one-way process and is irreversible. In this case, my forest function level is high enough so I will close Active Directory Domain and Trusts and go back to the Server Manager. In this case, I will create a domain-based namespace which will be accessible to the user by mapping a drive to double backslash test.local slash general. Once I press Next, I will be asked which domain admin account I wish to use to create the DFS namespace. If you are creating a standalone namespace, you only require local administrator rights to the server on which you are creating the namespace. Since this is a domain namespace, I need to specify a user account with domain administrator access. Once I have entered a username and password for a user with domain administrator access, I can press the Next button and move on to configuring the namespace. At the moment, there is nothing in the namespace. To make it more useful, I will press the Add button to add a share to the namespace. You will notice that if I enter in the server app 2 and press the button Show Shared Folders, I can see a list of all the shared folders on the server. The share that I want to add to my DFS namespace is the share Software Installs. On different servers in the organization, this folder has been called different names. This is where the real power of DFS comes into play. Before I add this share to the DFS namespace, I can change software installs to simply software. Now when I press OK, the software install share will be added to the DFS namespace and appear as software. If I press Next and then press Install, DFS will now be installed on my server. The install is quite simple and only takes a minute or so. Once complete, this server will be able to either host or create new DFS namespaces. Now that DFS is installed, let's review Windows Server 2008 mode. 
To enable Windows Server 2008 on your namespace, all your namespace must be running Windows Server 2008. Your forest function level must be Windows Server 2003 or higher. Finally, your domain function level must be Windows Server 2008 or higher. If your network has all this in place, you can set your Windows Server 2008 mode DFS namespaces. These namespaces will be able to support access based enumeration. This means that if a user does not have access to a shared folder, the folder will not appear to the user. Windows Server 2008 mode also offers improvements in scalability. With Windows Server 2008, your DFS namespace can support more than 5,000 targets. Most networks will not have DFS namespaces with more than 5,000 targets. However, if your namespace does start getting larger, there is a scalability option you can configure. The first setting is Optimize for Consistency. This is the default mode for DFS namespaces. When this mode is enabled, DFS servers will pull the PDC emulator at regular intervals for namespace changes. The PDC emulator is covered in more detail in the Active Directory course. Back in the Windows NT days, all changes in the user database were performed on the primary domain controller, or PDC. With the introduction of Windows Server 2000, all domain controllers gained the ability to make changes. In some cases, some changes must still be made on one server and replicated to the other servers. Changes to the DFS namespace are made on one domain controller that has the role of the PDC emulator. This ensures that multiple changes are not made in different places. If you have a lot of DFS servers on your network, this will create a lot of network traffic and extra load on your PDC emulator. Microsoft recommends this mode when you have fewer than 16 namespace servers. If you have a large network or your namespace changes a lot, you should select the option Optimize for Scalability. When this mode is selected, your DFS server will pull the local domain controller for changes rather than the PDC emulator. Your DFS servers will make changes to the DFS namespace via the PDC emulator to ensure the namespace is consistent. These changes will not appear until Active Directory replicates. This means that when this mode is selected, there may be a delay before your end users see any changes in the DFS namespace. Microsoft recommends this mode when you have more than 16 namespace servers. With DFS, you can also set the ordering mode used when clients do not have access to a local file server. In the example before, the client accessing the DFS server, when possible, will be directed to a server in their local site. If no file share is available on the local site, the client may be directed to a server outside its local network. This can be done in a random order. You can also set server selection based on the lowest network cost. When you set up sites, you can set up a cost associated with the link. DFS will follow the links and add up the cost and use the path with the lowest cost. With the previous example of a software share, you may not want end users having access to a software share that is not in their local site. For example, you may create a local software share in every site, but if that server were not available, you don't want them performing installs of large software programs over the WAN. To prevent this from happening, you can choose to exclude targets outside of the client's site. Selecting this option will mean if the local server is not available, the client will need to wait until the server is back online before it will be able to access the file share. This prevents the client from accessing the data over the WAN link. Now that DFS has been installed, let's have a look at how to manage it using the DFS Admin tool.
To administer DFS, first run the DFS management tools from the administrative tools under the start menu. In the namespace section, you can see the namespace that I created when I installed DFS. To create a new namespace, select New Namespace from the right hand side. From the wizard, I will first need to enter in the namespace server that will hold the namespace. On the next screen, I need to enter in a share folder for DFS to use. In this case, I will enter in invoices. On this file server, there is already a share called invoices. If there was no file share set up, I could press the Edit Settings button and set up the permissions for the share. Once I press Next, I will get a message asking if I want to keep the existing permissions or overwrite them. In this case, I will keep the existing permissions. On the next screen, you can select where to store the namespace. If you select Standalone Namespace, it will be hosted on this server and not stored in Active Directory. This means that the server hosting the namespace must be up and running for the end users to access the namespace. If you want high availability for DFS with a standalone configuration, you will need to install Windows Server 2008 on a failover cluster. In order to access the namespace, you need to access it by the computer name as shown here. If I select Domain Name Namespace, you will notice that this time you can access DFS by the domain name rather than the computer name. This means the namespace can be accessed as long as a domain controller is available. You will also notice that the option for Windows Server 2008 mode. Because I raised my domain function level to Windows Server 2008, this option is now available. You can leave this option ticked if all the servers that are using DFS are Windows Server 2008. This includes the file servers as well as the domain controllers. If I now press Next and then press the Create button, the DFS namespace will now be created. If I exit the wizard, you can see the namespace has been added. If I now select the namespace that I just created, you will notice on the right hand side the path FS5 slash invoices. If I right click on the namespace and select Open in Windows Explorer, Windows Explorer will open, but there are no files in the directory. In Windows Explorer, if I now browse to the C drive of my file server and open the directory Invoices, the folder containing my invoices will appear. When you create a new DFS root like the one I did in this example, the previous shared folder will be remapped to a folder called DFS Roots. This directory contains a folder called Invoice that currently does not have any files in it. To fix this problem, all I need to do is copy all the files from the Invoices directory on the root directory into the directory DFS Roots. If I now close Windows Explorer and go back to the admin tool, at the top you can see test.local slash invoices. What essentially is happening is that when this location, test.local slash invoices, is accessed, the user is being redirected silently and transparently to FS5. This presents us with a problem. If FS5 is not available, your end users will not be able to access these files. The configuration data for the namespace is stored in Active Directory. However, the root of the namespace will direct to FS5. To provide high availability for this namespace, all I need to do is select the option Add Namespace and then enter in another server. In this case, FS3. Once I press OK, FS3 will be added, meaning that end users will be directed to one of the two servers listed when accessing the namespace. If one of the two servers is not available, the user will simply be directed to the other server. If you decide that you want to store data in the root of the DFS namespace, you should consider setting up a replicate to keep the data the same. To do this, right click on Replication and select 
New Replication Group. For the replication group, you can choose Multipurpose Replication Group, which basically means that all data will be replicated between all the different servers. The second option, Replication Group for Data Collection, is used when you have a central server collecting data that you need to replicate out to other servers. In most cases, you will want to choose the first option. On the next screen, you can choose a name for the replication group. In this case, I am replicating the root of the DFS namespace, so I will enter in DFS root replication. On the following screen, you need to enter in the servers that will be members of this replication group. In this example, FS3 and FS5 contain the root of the DFS namespace. On the next screen, you need to set up your topology. The first option is hub and spoke, which is currently grayed out. If I had three or more members in this replication group, I could select the option hub and spoke. When you use a hub and spoke topology, multiple servers are connected to the one server to replicate changes. The next option is full mesh. This means all servers in the replication group are connected to all other servers in the replication group. If you have a lot of members in your replication group, this means a lot of connections. For example, if you had 10 servers, each server would have 9 connections, one to each server in the replication group. The last option, no topology. This option allows you to configure your own topology. Since I only have two servers in this replication group, I will accept the default option Full Mesh. The next screen allows you to specify how much bandwidth you want to use with this replication group. If I select the option Replicate during the specified dates and times, I can now select the option Edit Schedule. The pull-down menu at the top lets you determine if the schedule is based on the local time of a server or if you want to use UTC time. If I select an area, I can choose how much bandwidth I want to use during that time. You can also limit bandwidth between certain hours. If I were to select the hours between 7 and 6, I can reduce the bandwidth usage. This means replication will still occur, but the speed of replication will be reduced. You can also make changes to just one day. For example, if I wanted to limit replication during the weekdays and limit replication during office hours. For this example, I will leave replication on the default full bandwidth 24 hours a day. On the next screen, you need to select a primary member. This server will act as an authoritative during replication conflicts. You should select the server that has the most up-to-date data. Once you have determined which server is the primary server, on the next screen, you need to determine the folder the data will come from. In this case, I will select the invoices directory under the DFS root. DFS will now replicate this data to the other servers. On the next screen, I need to set the path for the other servers in this replication group. You will notice that when I select the path, there is currently no data in the invoice directory. Once I set the path and move to the next screen of the wizard, I can now press Create and the replication group will be created. Once DFS has created the replication group, I can press Close to exit the wizard. When I press close, I get a warning telling me that replication may not occur immediately. Replication depends on the schedule I set up. If I now go into replication, select the replication group I just created, and then select the tab Connections, I can right-click the connection and select the option Replicate Now. DFS will replicate the folders. However, if you have just created the replication group, it may take some time for the changes to propagate through your network. I have paused the video for 10 minutes to give the DFS namespace time to configure itself on the network. 
If I now go back into my namespace and open the shared folder on FS3, you will notice that it has replicated from FS5. Any changes will now be replicated between the two servers. If I now go back to DFS management, I can select the namespace test.local slash general that I created when I installed DFS. You will notice that this share appears under root of the namespace. Currently, there is only one target. To add another target, I can right click software and select add folder target. From here it is a simple matter to browse to a server that contains a file share for software. Once I've added the file share, I will be asked if I want to configure another replication group. I will select no so I can show you how to do it manually. To add replication, select the tab replication and then select the option Replicate Folder Wizard. The wizard is the same as the one we did previously. For this reason, I will cancel out rather than doing it again. If I now right click the namespace and select Properties, there are a few options in here you may want to configure. If I select the Referrals tab, I can choose the ordering method. The ordering method only comes into play when Windows cannot find a file share in the same site as the client. Currently it is set to lowest cost. Each link in your network will have a cost associated with it. Windows will add up these costs and choose the lowest one. If I were to select random order, Windows will randomly select a target from the available ones on the network. The last option, exclude targets outside of the client site, will stop the client accessing a file share that is not local to the client. If you have slow links or large files, you may want to select this option. On the Advanced tab, you have the option Optimized for Consistency. Microsoft recommends that when you have less than 16 servers in your namespace to use this option. When a change to the namespace is performed, the PDC emulator will be contacted. The next option, Optimized for Scalability, Microsoft recommends to be used when you have more than 16 servers. When selected, your DFS servers will contact a domain controller rather than the PDC emulator. If your namespace is set up for Windows Server 2008 mode, you also have the option Enable Access Based Enumeration for this namespace. When selected, folders the client does not have access to will not be displayed. This concludes all the basic configuration of DFS. When looking at deploying DFS in your organization, remember that it supports multiple master replication, which includes deletes. You don't necessarily have to make every copy of the data writable, however. You could deploy read-only copies in your organization and still use DFS replication system. Remember the two DFS options. Optimize for consistency will keep your namespace up to date faster, but will put more load on your PDC emulator. Optimize for scalability is a better choice for large DFS namespaces. However, updates to the DFS namespace will not appear as quickly. If you want to use Windows Server 2008 features like larger DFS namespaces and access-based enumeration, all your DFS namespace servers must be running Windows Server 2008. Your domain function level must be set to Windows Server 2008 or higher. And finally, your forest level must be Windows Server 2003 or higher. When used correctly, DFS makes accessing data a lot easier for your end users and a lot more transparent.